this morning, that you would move through Pastor Michael, through the message that you have given him. That, Father, we would be able to know that we have been in the presence of God this morning. There would be no doubt. There would be no shame. There would be no question, Father God, that we would walk from this place with all the confidence that Christ has given us. And Father, we thank you again for this message. And I pray these things in the strong and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Just in awe, some mornings worship hits you a little bit differently than others, and um, that was beautiful this morning. Church, the, this morning we're going to be continuing in our series of women of the Bible. This morning we're going to be looking at two women, Miriam and Huldah. We're doing that because they have something in common. They are both considered prophetesses in scripture. And we're going to look at each one individually and then what they can teach us through their lives. If you would like to, please open your Bibles to Exodus 2. We'll be jumping into there and as always before we just jump into the text, we have to have context. So where we enter into this story is that Jacob has had 12 sons who will become the tribes of Israel. And Joseph has been taken away to Egypt and he has uh, risen to power 
He is now second in command under Pharaoh. And because of that, Egypt has flourished. Now, at this point, Joseph has died off. The Pharaoh that he served under has died off. And so there's generations that have gone by. And in that time frame, because the Pharaoh allowed Joseph to bring his family to Egypt, the Hebrew nation has grown. And so much so that the current Pharaoh feels threatened. And so he wants to do away with uh, these Hebrew people. And he wants to enslave them. God is about ready to do something incredible for these people. So when we jump into the text at Exodus 2, you're probably familiar with the story. This is the birth of Moses. Exodus 2 verse 1 begins, Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. And this is the story of Moses. That is the little boy. But when she could hide him no longer, she got him in, into a wicker basket and covered it over with tar and pitch. And then she put the child into it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to find out what would happen to him. That sister, by the way, is Miriam. In verse 5, the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the Nile with her maidens walking alongside the Nile, and she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid, and she brought it to her. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the boy was crying. And she had pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister, Miriam, said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go ahead. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. The child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son, and she named him Moses, and said, Because I drew him out of the water. If we've been in church for any amount of time, you should be familiar with this story. It's pretty straightforward. Moses is put into a basket, and he's sent down the Nile to be saved. Pharaoh's daughter finds him. And then Miriam does something interesting. She watches from a distance this basket travel down the Nile until it reaches Pharaoh's daughter. Now you have to understand something. At this point, scholars think that Miriam was probably somewhere between 10 and 12 years old, approximately. So this is a young girl. She's in danger. This is risky to follow this and see what happens, but she is incredibly brave because not only does she follow the basket, but once Pharaoh's daughter picks the basket up, Miriam goes and she kind of, she fibs a little bit. Kind of. She says, hey, you know what? Would you want me to find a Hebrew woman that could nurse this baby for you? And Pharaoh's daughter says, sure. Well, it's not just any Hebrew woman. It's Moses' mother. Now think about that. She's going to nurse the child, meaning until this baby can be away from the mother, she's going to take care of Moses. She's going to sing to him. She's going to tell him stories. Miriam's going to be around Moses. And then eventually, when Moses gets old enough and he doesn't have to be nursed, she will go, or he, sorry, will go to Pharaoh, to the daughter, Pharaoh's daughter. Now, it's kind of a, a weird story because you have this narrative here, and we, we, see, um, we see Miriam as a little girl. But then we're going to make a jump, and we're going to see something happen in this jump. We're going to go to Exodus 15 and verse 19. Now again, let me set the context. You all know the story. 
is that Moses is going to rescue the Hebrew slaves from Egypt. And so God sends these plagues upon Egypt one after another until eventually the Pharaoh says, okay, get them out of here. And the Hebrew slaves walk out of Egypt and they get to the Red Sea. And of course, you know the story that Moses raises his staff and God, in a tremendous way, parts the Red Sea, allows the Hebrew slaves to cross, and when they are safely across, then God closes the Red Sea and kills the entire Egyptian army. When that happens, you will see that Moses... And the men of Israel sing for joy. Not only have they been rescued and this prophecy fulfilled, but they have just witnessed not only the tremendous power of God and a miracle being performed, but now they're, they're free and they're safe. They have received salvation from Egypt. Now, what happens is they're in this song. They're rejoicing. And we're going to pick up in Exodus 15, verse 19, and listen to what Miriam does. In verse 19, it says, For the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, and the Lord brought the waters of the sea on them. But the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea. Miriam, the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dancing. Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and his rider he has hurled into the sea. You see what Miriam did? It said she led all the women of Israel with timbrels and dancing. She was leading the women. So Moses is, has all the men singing. This is a joyful moment. This is a celebration. And Miriam gathers the women and plays instruments and dances. It's pretty significant because it tells us something. The scripture says Miriam the prophetess. Well, how was she a prophetess? I don't know. Don't you love that? Pastor, you're supposed to have all the answers. No, no, there's some voids in Scripture. It never says clearly why she's called a prophetess. All that we know from the time that she was a little girl until now, something dramatic, very dramatic has happened. She's no longer this little girl. She is now a prophetess, and she is leading the women of Israel. But there's something more that we have to understand about Miriam. If we go to Micah, we're going to see something here. Now, we have all of these prophets of Israel. And these prophets play a very specific role. They're there to warn Israel of things to come. And in this particular case, Micah is speaking God's indictment upon Israel. This is judgment. So this is not a happy-go-lucky message here in Micah verse I'm sorry Micah 6 verse 1 it says this hear now what the Lord is saying arise plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice I love that that's, that's Micah being sarcastic it was like go ahead we'll cry out to the mountains tell them plead your case because they can't do anything for you in verse 2 he says listen you mountains to the indictment of the Lord, and you, enduring foundations of the earth, because the Lord has a case against his people. Even with Israel, he will dispute. That's very important. Even with Israel. Israel, God's chosen people, yes? These are his children. And the prophet is saying, even with your, God's children, he will dispute. He's going to correct them. In verse 3, my people, what have I done to you? And how have I weaned you? Answer me. Indeed, I brought you up from the land of Egypt and ransomed you 
from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Oh. Why did he say that? Why did he say, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam? Could it be that he's just pointing out their brothers and sisters? No. That's certainly not the case. These are the leaders of Israel. Moses has a very specific function, and that's very clear in Scripture. He is the leader over the entirety of the nation. Moses is the man. He's responsible for everything. But within that context, Aaron and Miriam have specific roles. Aaron is to be the high priest. Miriam, we're coming to understand, led the women of Israel, all of them. She's a prophetess, and she's leading this very fledgling nation. Now, we're going to make a jump because we understand Miriam a little bit better, but we have to talk about Huldah because we've got to get to what does all this mean? Why are we studying these two? So to understand the story of Huldah, we're going to jump to 2 Kings 22. Now again, context matters. It's kind of a comical story where we enter into. Israel has been in a state of rebellion. And I've talked about before how they have this cycle of sin where they, they sin and they, they just go off and they do their own thing. And then God somehow makes them aware that they're sinning. And they repent and they come back to God and they worship God. And then they get sidetracked and they enter this cycle of sin. And so this, this just keeps going over and over again. In the process of this, somehow they lose the law. Now let me be very specific on that. This is the Old Testament. So we don't have the Bible yet, okay? All we have is the law. I don't know how that can possibly happen, but it's happened, and it's happened repeatedly. And so when we enter into the text, there's a conversation going on between these men who have found the law. So in 2 Kings 22, verse 8, it begins, Then Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan who read it. Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought back word to the king and said, Your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house and had delivered it into the hand of the workmen who have, who have the oversight of the house of the Lord. Moreover, Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Let's pause there. Imagine that. Hilkiah, the, the priest. He's like, hey, I found it. Here it is. Here's the law. And he gives it to the scribe, and the scribe takes it to the king. And the king reads it, and he weeps. He tears his clothes. Now that loses its emphasis on us today. What, what's the significance of tearing his clothes? It's mourning. It's a way of grief in the ancient world. They would rip their clothes. They would cover themselves in dirt and ash. They would get hot and sweaty and, and sticky. You know, when you're dirty and you're sweaty, you get sticky with all that on you. It was to make yourself uncomfortable. You see, in the ancient world, grieving wasn't just emotional. It was physical and spiritual. I am going to be distressed. I'm going to be in mourning. So all of me, the entirety of me, is grieving. I'm uncomfortable. I don't want to be here. And who's doing that? The king. The king is setting an example. He goes, we have been wrong, folks. We now have the law set before us. In verse 12, when we pick back up, he says, the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, 
Achbor, the son of Micaiah, Shaphan, the scribe, and Asaiah, the king's servant, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me and the people in all Judah concerning the words of this book that have been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that burns against us, because our fathers have not listened to the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So look what he does. The king gathers his counsel. This is wise men. And he said, you need to go out and talk to the people. We've messed up. Our fathers have messed up. We've not been following the law, clearly. It was just read to me, and we're wrong. So you need to go, and go out to the people and see if you can find somebody and tell us what all this means and what we're supposed to do now. Let me say that again. The king gathers his wise counsel out to figure this out and listen what they do. In verse 14, so Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam, Akbor, Shaphan, Asaiah went to Hulda the prophetess. They went to Hulda the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, the son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she lived in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they spoke to her. Why would wise men go to a woman? This is the ancient world, and I've stressed this to make this point intentional. This is the ancient world. Women weren't even second class. They were, they were less than almost property. So why would wise men go to a prophetess? Listen to what she says in verse 15. She said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me, meaning the king, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I bring evil on this place and on its inhabitants, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah has read. Isn't that interesting that God is speaking through Huldah, who wasn't part of that event, exactly what transpired? Verse 17, Because they have forsaken me and have burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath burns against this place, and it shall not be quenched. Folks, God is about ready to bring down his wrath on all of Israel. That's what he's saying there. He's going to, my wrath is going to burn against Israel. It's not going to be quenched. I'm not going to hold back. Verse 18, But to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, thus says the Lord God of Israel, regarding the words which you have heard. Because your heart was tender, and you humbled yourself before the Lord, when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse, You have torn your clothes and wept before me. I truly have heard you, declares the Lord. Some of you need to hear that. Some of you think that just because you're in misery and you're in suffering, that God doesn't hear you. God doesn't always acknowledge that, but I assure you God always hears that. And listen, he says the king... He's acknowledging the king tore his clothes and he wept. I heard him. So therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers and you will be gathered to your grave in peace. This is the king specifically. And your eyes will not see all the evil which I will bring on this place. So they brought back word to the king. So what Hulda is saying is, God is going to render his righteous judgment on all of Israel. You've done the cycle of sin enough times. God says, I'm done with that. I've given you ample warning. Now you're going to suffer my wrath. But because the king heard the word, and he wept, and he tore his clothes, and he was sorrowful, 
He's not going to see what's coming. Church, this may seem weird, but that's mercy. What he's telling the king is, you're going to die before I bring my wrath down on Israel. Because you are holy and you are righteous, you don't have to see what's coming. I'm going to spare you from that. That's a mercy we sometimes have trouble understanding. But God is merciful. God's going to do it regardless. He's going to bring down his judgment, but he's going to spare the king from seeing it. Now here's what you need to understand about the prophets. Because this, the, the prophets play a role in all of this. Now I'm not going to list all of them. But last year we read through the Bible and these names should sound familiar. So God sends Jonah to tell a message, a warning message to, uh, to nations. And then Joel and then Amos and then Hosea, Isaiah, Micah, Nahum, Zephaniah, Habakkuk. Now remember, he keeps sending these. Sometimes we have a trouble with God rendering his judgment. Look how many times God has said, hey, you need to correct yourself. You need to correct yourself. And he keeps doing that. But they don't. And they go through all of these prophets, and then, then, he sends Huldah. It's a different voice. It's a, it's a female voice. And then, after Huldah, he sends one more. He sends Jeremiah. Jeremiah is the last voice. And then you know what happens? Israel is carried away. Nebuchadnezzar comes and um, takes Israel and takes it away. And it's a very brutal hardship because of that. And I wonder in that, why, why is Huldah there? And when you look at the timeline, she comes right at the end. And it makes perfect sense to me. Let me give you an analogy you can all understand. I've shared with you that I grew up on a farm. There was four of us, my dad, and my two brothers, and myself, and then my mom. My mom weighed 100 pounds soaking wet. She loved to cook. That home, the, the home, the country home, was her castle. She kept it immaculate. How on a farm? I have no idea. You never saw a pillow out of place on the couch, never saw anything on the floor. It was pristine. When you went into that house, now my mom weighed 100 pounds soaking wet. I'm six feet tall. I assure you, I bowed to my mom. She carried an authority that I never questioned. My dad never had to say it. When my mom asked for something, that's what you did. You know what's interesting? My mom had authority. She spoke in a different way. She didn't sound like my dad when she talked. When she said something sternly, yes ma'am. It was in a different context. This is exactly what God is doing. In this case, in this story, God has sent all of these prophets who are men to warn of God's incoming, oncoming judgment. And Israel is not listening. He said, all right, let me try something else. I'll send a woman. Listen to her. She carries authority. She's a prophetess. And yet they still will not listen. Church, I want to affirm something this morning that's really important I know we know this, but sometimes we need to put things right in front of our face and acknowledge it. The church in the Nazarene affirms women in ministry. We affirm women of authority. And I want to show you that this morning. If we were to go to our articles, and we'll go to 501, there it is, and I'll read it for you. This is the theology of women in ministry. If you've never met, read our manual, now you're not going to have any excuse because I'm going to tell it to you. The Church of the Nazarene supports the right of women to use their God-given spiritual gifts 
within the church and affirms the historic right of women to be elected and appointed to places of leadership within the church of the Nazarene, including the offices of both elder and deacon. That means senior pastor. Church, let me go back for a second. Did you hear the language in there? And affirms the historic right. What historic right? We've been doing a series on women in the Bible. And we've looked at different aspects of each woman and what they contribute. And throughout that, you should see something. There's women in leadership roles. All the way back to Genesis. Now, let me head something off. I know some of you are saying, wait a minute, Pastor. There's things. What about Paul? Paul says the contrary. Well, can I affirm something here? What Paul is saying is right? Huh? <laughs> How can that be? Wait, don't they contradict? No, they don't. We're going to cover that another day, and I'm going to come back and explain what that difference is. It's cultural. It's set for a specific time. It's not meant to be an all-time thing. You Remember, Scripture, do we look... Let me back up here. Too many thoughts are hitting my head at the same time. <laughs> Remember me telling you, when we quote scripture, the smaller the verse, the more dangerous it is, yes? So when we were to come to understand the Bible, do we look at one book or do we look at 66? We look at 66. We look at the entirety of scripture to teach us. We don't pull one particular thing out. Now look at this. I have been studying in proclaiming women on the Bible throughout the entire Bible. Do we say that what one book says undoes the other 65? So here's what I'm saying. What Paul is saying is correct and true for a very specific reason for that time frame that doesn't pertain. It's not an all-time command, and that's how the Church of the Nazarene views that. But I want to continue on. I want to read one other thing from our manual. This is from section 502. This is the theology of ordination. It says, while affirming the scriptural tenet of the universal priesthood and ministry of all believers, ordination reflects the biblical belief that God calls and gifts certain men and women for ministerial leadership in the church. Ordination is the authenticating, authorizing act of the church which recognizes and confirms God's call to ministerial leadership as stewards and proclaimers of the gospel in the church of Jesus Christ. Consequently, ordination bears witness to the church universal and to the world at large that this candidate, man or woman, evidences an exemplary life of holiness possesses gifts and graces for public ministry, has a thirst for knowledge, especially for the word of God, and has the capacity to communicate sound doctrine. Whoever authored that sure didn't leave room for much ambiguity, did they? That is very well written. It says that regardless who you are, that there is a process towards ordination. And as a pastor in the Church of the Nazarene, I am in that process. And it's a series of checks and balances by the elders in the church that hold those that are going towards ordination accountable. They want to make sure, are you really anointed by God? Are you really a pastor? But what this says is, it doesn't make a difference if you're a man or a woman. If God has anointed you, then you have a role in the church. And I hope that you see through this series that God is anointing women for very specific reasons. Church, I'm going to tell you something. When I get around a godly woman, and I can sense that she's been anointing, I shut my mouth. When God speaks through a woman... 
It's for a reason. You should open your ears. And I'm speaking, I'm going to be direct here. I'm speaking to the men because sometimes we have a hard time with that. (laughs) Could we affirm that anymore? (laughs) Notice I said, though, that the woman is anointed by God. So let's keep this in context. But if a man or a woman is anointed by God, they have a specific purpose and mission. We know this from Scripture. I'm going to affirm this from Scripture. If we go to Joel 2, verse 28, it says this, It will come about after this that I will pour out my Spirit on all mankind, and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. God will equip all for his kingdom, folks. I want you to be comfortable with that. And I also welcome any debate, any discussion. You come see me after service. You come make an appointment. We'll go have a cup of coffee I'm not here to argue, I'm here to talk. Let's have a conversation. But I will tell you this, my belief is that with the church, that God equips all for ministry. So let's get back to Miriam and Huldah. What are they teaching us? What are we to learn from these two prophetesses? Well, number one, be courageous. Let me say something here. Men, look at me for a second. When I make these points and say, what are Miriam and Huldah to teach us? That's for you too. Don't interpret that as, oh, okay, women, this is what you're supposed to do. No, no, no. They are teaching all of us something. So number one, be courageous. Huldah teaches us. Huldah had to tell the king of Israel that he was going to suffer, that, I'm correction, that Israel was going to suffer God's wrath. He was going to die. Huldah had to have courage to tell the king he wasn't going to be a king for very much longer. Something as terrible is going to happen to Israel. Number two, thank God for every blessing and every trial you have. Miriam led women in song after Egypt was destroyed. There's a whole lot of emotion that goes on with that because for so many years, the Hebrew slaves were oppressed. They would sing in song as slaves. Not unlike the slaves of the South. I'm sure some of you have heard these songs where they would work in the cotton fields and they would sing songs, oftentimes gospel songs. It was to motivate them, to keep them focused on God. And here we find Miriam leading all the women in dance and music. We need to be thankful in blessing and in trial. Number three, they teach us to use our gifts for God's glory. Miriam led the women with music and dancing. Hulda knew God's word and proclaimed it. I've said this time and time again, Christianity is not a noun. It's not a title. It's a verb. You're to put it into action. Every single one of these women did something. They didn't just have this skill set. They didn't have this talent. They put it into action. That's exactly what we're supposed to do. We have to use our gifts for God's glory, church. And number four, our ministry will benefit future generations. When we look at the prophet Micah, he spoke of Miriam's leadership. If you were a Jew, to this day you were taught the story of Huldah. For a reason. It benefits, it educates the Jewish community. Church, what is going to be your legacy? What are you going to leave to this world? 
Who will speak of what you've done with your time here at South Lake? Hmm, got quiet. We're called to action. What are you going to be remembered for? I have this incredible vision in my head that just constantly, it's always there. It reminds me of legacy. After I die, I'm in heaven. I'm there for many years. I'm standing there one day. Somebody taps me on the shoulder. And I turn around. This person says, you don't know me. But I just wanted to let you know that you spoke to my great, 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 grandfather, great mother, grandmother, because you shared the gospel with them, because you changed a tire, because you fed them food, because you put them up in a hotel, because you, insert anything there, because you did that, they believed in God. And that faith continued on after them, and I'm here because of that single act. Church, what are you going to do? Now is the time to act. Do not wait. Allow us to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for these incredible narratives that you have sent down through history of these women that have taught us so much through this series that each one has a specific message. I thank you for the Holy Spirit, for the transformation of our hearts, that there's a healing process, that there's redemption. Father, I thank you for your love. Just your incomprehensible, beautiful love. Father, I ask that you guide us as we move forward with South Lake, that we develop a legacy as a church, not just as individuals, but as a church. From this moment forward, when people speak of South Lake, that people will say, yeah, I've heard of that church. I know what you're doing there. I ask this not for popularity, not for ego, but because of how you're using this church to transform this region, that in a tangible way, we are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Father, may this mission be burned upon our hearts. May we not be set free from this task until we're welcome home to you. In your son's holy name, Jesus Christ, amen. Let's respond together in song this morning. Would you stand with us as we sing here the call of the king? Father's 
Can I have a heart check for a second? We sing and worship. Is that for us or for God? Here's a question that you need to ask your heart. That song we just sang, we will answer the call. Will you? Were you just singing to make yourself feel better? Or are you going to live out the very words that you just spoke? Christianity is a verb. We are meant to transform this world around us. Church, if you'd like to receive a, a blessing, would you hold out your hands like this? You've heard a story today of two women who showed us two different elements, two different perspectives of leadership. It's been passed down through the millennia for you, for you to hear it, for you to be changed by God's word so you could do something. So South Lake, you are charged now with carrying out the will of God to be the hands and feet of Christ for this region. Go now in power, in love, in hope, in redemption and salvation that your Lord loves you. He has equipped you for a specific time such as this. Church, hug somebody, tell them you love them, and we'll see you next week. God bless you.